Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's lecture. It's really wonderful to see so many people here tonight. And while I think we're all feeling a little bit sad, maybe not to be able to be like this in person, I feel really happy that we're able through this virtual format that we've all become so familiar with um, to be able to share these events so widely. And there are people here tonight from, from all over the world. Now, it's always a great pleasure to be able to welcome a guest speaker to Oxford, even virtually. Um, but it's a rare pleasure indeed to be able to welcome four, but that's what we're doing this evening. So we're joined by Dr. Evan Zaporin, the Kian Sahin Di Distinguished Professor of Music at MIT and Director of MIT's Centre for Art, Science and Technology, by Dr. Ian Hatwick, Lecturer in Music Technology at MIT, musician and composer Christine Southworth, and engineer Dr. Isabel Sue. And we're going to talk about music and physics. Now, there's no question, I don't think, that our interest in the connectivity between music and physics stretches right back to the intellectual, intellectual foundations of human society. Two and a half thousand years ago, for example, the great Pythagoras, uh, the near in mathematics, physics and musical theory too, famously is reported to have said that there is, quote, geometry in the humming of the strings and music in the spacing of the spheres. Or in other words, that there's music in physics and also physics in music. And this enduring claim sits alongside, I think, a sense that exists in every culture that there's an important set of commonalities between our inclinations to make music and to do physics. And both physicists and musicians often talk about the extent to which they are inspired in what they do by a sense that their discipline gives them a kind of connectivity with something universal, something beyond themselves. And the 17th century astronomer Johannes Kepler, for example, he wrote, we do not ask for what useful purpose the birds do sing. Similarly, we ought not to ask why the human mind troubles to fathom the secrets of the heavens. And it's easy to see, perhaps, why such comparisons are appealing. We arguably make music and make progress in physics through the interplay between the same three processes, intuition, creativity and knowledge. And in both disciplines, we need all three of these ingredients, but we can profitably use them in very different proportions. So we can rely primarily on creativity and intuition, or we can take a fundamentally technically rooted, or you might say kind of knowledge-based approach. And these different mixtures suit the production of different kinds of physics, just as they suit the production of different kinds of music. And successful physical theories are often described using the same words that we use to describe successful pieces of music. Uh, things like elegant, beautiful, even mesmerizing or inspiring. And although it may not be so easy to work out why we use those descriptions and why we feel this way, I guess that's a job for the philosophers, it, it definitely has something to do with the fact that the universe is no more just a load of atoms than Mahler's Second Symphony or that great guitar solo in Stairway to Heaven is a load of notes. So today we're joined by Evan, Christine, Ian and Isabel to take a really interesting and also very contemporary look at physics and music making. And this lecture also represents a first public start point in a collaborative project that we'll be working on together here in Oxford to look at how we can create artistic sonic representations, virtual instruments informed by the geometry and physics of crystal structures. And we plan to begin, as the title of this talk suggests, with snowflakes. So on that note, over to you, Evan.
Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Alexi, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm going to do the juggling required to share my screen. So um, we are here, as Alexi mentioned, as uh, the opening salvo for an artist's residency with Trinity College Oxford and with the physics department. Uh, and as she also told you, we're planning on having that culminate in a new work of art. Um, which will be a data-based installation slash performance piece based on crystal structure, as she mentioned, of snowflakes. Um, she mentioned Kepler, and that's nicely coincidentally because uh, we're tentatively calling this project De Nive Sexangula on the six-cornered snowflake, which is taken from Kepler's treatise of the same name. Um, but as she also mentioned, that project is just in the preliminary stage, and uh, so we'll return to it later. But I hope that what we present uh, about a prior project will give you some context for it and a, a taste of what it's likely to be. One of the things it definitely involves is some degree of physical proximity of being in the same place at the same time. And obviously that's not possible right now. So we're hoping that science works its magic in many ways and we'll be able to be there by late spring, but We'll get there at some point and we will do this project. Right now, the four of us all come to you from the US, from the very cold Boston area, uh, where we are more or less orbiting around our home base, which is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So what you're hearing and seeing right now in the background is a short excerpt from the piece we'll mainly be talking about today, which is a 2018 project called Arachnodrone spider's canvas. And this project is something of an older brother to the snowflake project we hope to be doing. So what you're looking at is a data-based immersive audiovisual installation with live performers. You're seeing a cube which is three meters in dimension. It's covered with a semi-transparent scrim and mounted on an aluminum frame. And there's video being projected onto it from three sides. There are four operators, which happen to be the four of us, myself, Christine Southworth, Isabel Sue, and Ian Hatwick. We're inside and we'll be telling you a little bit why we're there later. Um, and as I think is clear from uh, the introduction and from what you're seeing and hearing, this was a multidisciplinary undertaking, somewhere in the intersection of science and art. And as Alexi mentioned in her introduction, that intersection goes back a long way and as social media might put it, that relationship is complicated. Um, that would be a long discussion, possibly a series of discussions, and probably not the discussion that we wanna to have today. Lexi also mentioned Pythagoras, and somehow for musicians, things always go back to Pythagoras in the sixth century BCE. Uh, here he is with his disciples uh, multitasking uh, this is uh, a 15th century woodcut, but uh, it shows various stages of uh, figuring out things about how music works. So on the upper left, you have the legendary hammers of Jubal, which uh, probably didn't happen. The idea was that they were hammering on anvils. And if we really wanted to get into it, I explain why that's probably not the way they figured out how to tune things, but uh, it's a good story. And on the upper right, you see he's playing some kind of glass harmonica and comparing it to bells, which have some numbers on them of some importance having to do with proportion. In the lower left, uh, he's playing a monochord, which looks kind of like a hammer dulcimer. And then in the bottom right, they're playing flutes. Um, and what this is illustrating is the foundation for our understanding of pitch as frequency and of frequency as being inversely proportional to size. So the smaller the pipe, the higher the pitch, uh, and the same being true of the bells. And finally, of musical intervals themselves, resonance, chords, as ratio with low integer ratios, such as the ones shown here in this diagram, sounding quote unquote better than higher integer ones. So uh, I made a little illustration of this just using sinusoidal waves or digital um, imitations of sinusoidal waves. So what you're gonna hear is a perfect fifth, a perfect Pythagorean fifth. That's an exact three, two ratio of frequency, 600 to 400 if you count. And then I'm gonna start lowering one of the pitches from this perfect sound. 
until it hits an 11 to 8 ratio, still pretty low, but one that's not just bad, but was eventually regarded as being evil, the intervallus diabolus in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And then, just for the fun of it, I figured I would take it down to a unison because you hear all sorts of interesting things as it winds its way down. Now we're entering into the critical band where things are so close you can't tell. And then you start to hear the actual beats. And when they hit the perfect unison, that's the end of the demo. So this idea of intervals being ratios and low integer ratios being uh, more consonant, this has really stood the test of time. These concepts from 500 BC feel relevant to me every single day as a musician. Literally, every time I pick up my instrument, every time I tune it, every time I compose a note, they are still the underpinnings in theory and practice for Western tuning systems, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and they play a big role in uh, the project that we were going to talk to you about. Um, now, one of the reasons that it's lasted so long, as that prior illustration suggests, is that these ideas are based on rigor. They're based on observation. They're demonstrable. They're repeatable. Uh, that's, which is to say, they're based on some form of the scientific method. Now, Pythagoras also projected outward from this. Uh, into the heavens to the notion of the music universalis, which is thought of as the music of the spheres. And the idea was that heavenly bodies rotated and resonated in a way that was absolutely in accord with those same acoustic principles, which is why this illustration from the 17th century by R. Flood, music of the spheres, looks so much like that little diagram I showed you, because these proportions were felt to have to be the way the heavens were also um, proportioned and in the same accordance of consonance and dissonance. Uh, and you can see that Kepler actually got into the act two in his Harmonices Mundi and actually wrote out the scales for each planet for our convenience. Um, now, all of this was eventually, this didn't hold up as well as the tuning stuff did. So this was all, of course, disproven and superseded, um, but it's still a very powerful idea. And the idea of listening to the heavens actually stays very important as those of us who remember the uh, confirmation of gravity waves from uh, LIGO in 2015, this famous chirp. I don't know if it's what Pythagoras had in mind for the music of the spheres, but I hope he would have approved. Uh, but what's important about this is that what was measured was acoustic. It wasn't the music universalis that Pythagoras thought, but it was the music of the universe and it verified scientific theory. Now, three years before that famous ripple in 2012, the MIT Center for Art, Science and Technology was launched. I have the honor of being the inaugural faculty director of that, along with Lee Kinney, my co-director. And we invited for our first residency, the amazing artist scientist, Tomas Saraceno, showed here in one of his sculptures. Uh, he came to campus numerous times for several years and he collaborated with several departments, including aeronautics, uh, School of Architecture, and also with uh, Professor Marcus Bueller of Civil Engineering. You can see uh, Professor Bueller on the left and another MIT faculty member, very respected, John Oxendorf in the center and Tomas on the right. Uh, at a panel they did uh, in 2014. And from the slide behind them, you can see that they shared a great interest in spiders and spider webs, which also played a huge role in this project. But on that first Saraceno visit in 2012, my role was basically to be his shepherd or Sherpa, schlepping him around uh, and making sure he got places. And that also got me the perk of being able to spend a lot of time with him take him to a lot of meals, which were followed by various imbibements. And at one of those meals, uh, we began talking and Tomas began talking about how he had a dream of building a spider web instrument, um, which the way he described it seemed to be something like a giant trampoline that was also kind of a drum circle. Um, it wasn't, the details were not particularly clear, but the idea was planted. And the gist of that idea was that a spider's web was in fact already something of an instrument because it vibrates and vibration is sound, vibration is music. Spider web vibrations are not perceived by the human ear, but the human ear can hear lots of things like gravity waves. So as Tomas described it, when the spider moves around, she is playing her web. 
She's also listening to her web, not through her ears, for the simple reason that she doesn't have ears, but through her legs and other sensory apparatus. She's feeling its vibrations. She's responding. So the web isn't just her house. It's not just a trap for prey. It's also an instrument, and it's also a place to listen. And what the spider hears or senses more properly is based not just on what's vibrating in what way, but on her own location within the web. So please keep all of that in mind too. Now, a couple of years later, I was in Berlin. I went to Tomas's factory by invitation. I happened to have my bass clarinet and Tomas took me to a room where he had just put microphones in and around a spider's web and he was amplifying the spider's vibrations through various types of microphones. And he said, oh, you know, she's really active today. That's very unusual. Maybe you want to get your instrument on and improvise with her? So I did. Uh, and there we are. And uh, then we released it on a record. Um, now, to be fair, uh, he was inviting a lot of musicians to make music with the spiders. So I wasn't the other, only human on the disc. But right now, this is just uh, me and her an unnamed uh, Sirtophora citricola spider. Uh, now, it's certainly poetic license to think of what we're doing as an interspecies collaboration, let alone communication. But please at least consider this. I don't know what the spider made of all this. I don't know if she was responding to me or not. I don't know if she loved it. I don't know if she hated it. I don't know if she noticed what I was doing. But on the other hand, I play music with a lot of people. And quite honestly, I don't always know what they're thinking or what they're feeling or if they're listening. So um, in any case, back at MIT, I've already mentioned my wonderful colleague, Marcus Bueller, at that time, head of civil engineering. And as mentioned, he and Tomas Saraceno had bonded over spiders, which Professor Bueller was originally interested in and is still interested in for structural engineering purposes, what can be learned from the way they produce silk, construct a web, etc. Uh, Isabel Sue is going to return to that point in a few minutes. But uh, Professor Bueller also is something of a polymath. In fact, he's a musician himself. Uh, he's a, a great scientist artist uh, in the um, in the um, in line with Albert Einstein, Richard Fein Feynman, and, and the like. And he uh, himself began making sonifications of materials of various kind, amino acids, proteins, uh, etc. Now, what do I mean by this sonification? Many of you are familiar with the term, but for those of you that aren't, the simplest way to define it is as the aural equivalent of data visualization, translating data sets or measurements or models into something hearable, and if you like, calling it music. Um, in a way, the music universalis is a type of theoretical sonification. Uh, and in fact, it's actually, just to mention really quickly, one that a lot of musicians have tried to realize over the years. I just threw together a few album covers here of, of Strauss Waltz's Music of the Spears, of the great Mike Oldfield's Music of the Spears, Mannheim Steamroller's Music of the Spears, Coldplay's Music of the Spears. Maybe we've had a, a, enough Music of the Spears for a while, but um, again, it stood the test of time. As for Marcus Bueller, uh, his name may be familiar to you because he became something of a meme for sonification this year when he sonified the gene sequence of the COVID-19 virus, which obviously elicited a lot of strong responses. That's a whole discussion in itself. But that aside, what this is, is just a really superb example of what might think of as a pure sonification in which the gene sequence itself becomes a kind of score. The researcher slash composer sets the mapping Certainly he makes a lot of decisions about that uh, regarding sound and scale, but having made those decisions, he just lets the data speak or sing for itself. You can find this on SoundCloud, uh, very easy. I don't know that there's any other sonifications of the COVID virus, so. Um. Now, meanwhile, uh, Saraceno was invited to mount a large-scale carte blanche exhibition at the Palais de Tokyo, a wonderful uh, art gallery in Paris. And he asked me uh, if I could mount some kind of spider and spider musical performance for part of it. So I asked Professor Bueller if he might have someone on his team who would be interested in discussing this, um, thinking back to my conversation with Tomas about an instrument. And he told me he had this wonderful graduate student who was working specifically on spiders and web construction. 
Uh, and this is where Isabel Sue, at that time a graduate student, now Dr. Isabel Sue, comes into the picture. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the narrative over to her. Please welcome Dr. Isabel Sue. Um, hi. Uh, thank you, Evans, uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Isabel. Uh, I'm a P I mean, I'm a PhD student at MIT, and now I will uh, do a short presentation on three-dimensional spider webs and sonification. Uh, so spiders are extremely abundant in most ecosystems. They have been present for over 380 million of years, and they make up more than 49,000 different species. So they are the proof of evolutionary success, and they were able to survive and prosper for so long because of their adaptation skills. For example, uh, spiders can spin up to seven different types of silks, each used for different functions, and they can build different web architectures. Uh, from simple T webs to uh, typical 2D orb webs, which are composed of strong radial threads and extensible sticky spiral uh, threads. Uh, they can also build complex 3D spider web architectures, such as tent web, uh, tangle web. Uh, so now we'll show you how to image a 3D spider web uh, to get the to understand the 3D spider web architecture. Uh, to image a spider web, we first need to build a spider web. Uh, to do that, uh, we first built a frame uh, that we put into a container filled with water. Then we put the spider on the frame. Uh, the water in the container helps the spider from escaping, uh, prevents the spider from escaping. And in this project, uh, we use a spider, uh, search for a feature called a spider to build the spider web. After a few days, uh, the spider has built its web and we can place the frame uh, and the spider web on the laser scanning machine. Uh, the laser scanning machine consists of a high resolution camera and a sheet laser moving along the depth of the spider web. And we can obtain a high resolution images of slices of the web illuminated by the laser. Uh, so here is a video of all the scans of slices of the search of us which call spider web uh, from the top to the bottom of the spider web. So uh, this part is the tangle region of the spider web. Uh, it has a complex uh, and irregular architecture. Then uh, we will see a very dense mesh uh, and that's the tent of the spider web right here. Uh, then after that tent region, we will see another tangle region. So that's a 3D spider web. Then we will use image processing uh, algorithms to uh, derive the uh, architecture of the spider web. Uh, this is a result of the image processing on the spider web. We can identify the tangled region, uh, the top and the bottom, and the dense tent region in the middle. So complex and uh, large data can be difficult to visualize. Uh, finding features would require manipulating the web model and carrying out uh, computational analysis. Uh, for example, uh, we need to rotate and zoom a 3D physical model to derive its information. So adding sonification uh, to a visualization, uh, adding sonification, which is a visualization a method through sound, will complement the visualization and add another perspective for understanding the model and natural spider webs. And this would be helpful for identifying key spider web features. So sonification is used in many applications such as fire alarms, cardiac monitoring, data exploration, and as well as uh, creative art uh, installations. Sonification is an excellent tool for data exploration as the human ear is actually more sensitive to temporal changes and pattern identification. So which allows for the identification of interesting data patterns in large and complex data sets combined with a visual representation. Uh, data sonification provides a more holistic experience of the data and can deepen our understanding of it, especially when the data is difficult to interpret the site only. And this is the case for the studies by the web. So here I present a sonification of a three-dimensional spider web. Uh, it is an intuitive and interactive way to manipulate data and sound uh, to find key spider web features. Uh, so this is a schematic of the interactive uh, sonification process. We first load the network data, here the three spider web structure, to the sonification model uh, that has been built on Unity 3D, a video game engine, and uh, which communicates with uh, Max 8, a multimedia software. The user interacts with the model by sending comments through, the, uh, through MIDI messages, Q 
keyboard, uh, the computer mouse, uh, VR headset, and controllers. Uh, the certification model produces audiovisuals that the user can use for data exploration, pattern recognition, and also as a creative uh, art platform. So this uh, is a schematic of the certification rules. Uh, a user enters a virtual 3D spider web and can control where they look at and where they go. Uh, in particular, they can change a parameter called the hearing radius. Uh, the fibers within the field of view of the user and within the chosen hearing radius will be sonified, which means that they will produce sound. Each sonified fiber is assigned a sine wave, which uh, together produce a more complex timbre. Uh, we chose to assign sine waves to the sonified fibers because of the similarities between hierarchical organization of silk and music. Spider webs hierarchical structure ranges from silk protein to micrometer uh, size fibers to centimeter scale spider web. And in the same way, music is organized at its lowest scale in sine waves building blocks, which, he, which then can be assembled to design uh, richer timbres. And at its highest scale, musical composition are created from those uh, combination of timbres. So this is an example of the sonification model where the user is changing their hearing radius. All the fibers within the uh, field of view and within the hearing radius produce sound. Uh, so here we see the pink fibers are the sonified fibers and then the user can control that radius and the blue fibers are silent. Uh, this is another example uh, where the user can change his, his uh, field of view. Uh, so when we go outside the spider web, we do not hear any fibers, but when we go back in, uh, we can hear those fibers. Uh, this is a demonstration of the VR version of the sonification model. Uh, we have used the spider web sonification. Uh, yes, so you can change a lot of parameters. Uh, such as the hearing radius or the frequency range. Uh, and then um, this uh, sonification model has been used uh, for the Spiders Canvas Arachno Joint Project as a art uh, and creative platform. Okay. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and take over and talk a little bit about the process of translating the spider web, really the instrument that Isabel created um, based on that one uh, spider web, and think a little bit about how we could use it in performance and also think a little bit about sound design of the instrument from a more of a musical perspective. So I'm also thinking a lot about sonification. Um, and uh, Evan mentioned uh, earlier sonification is a very powerful tool. Uh, we can use our auditory channel in a very different way than our visual channel to identify patterns and temporal structures that might not be as visually perceptible as they are auditorily perceptible. And so for all of us, the idea that the spider web is a source of data that's really interesting and complex and is sort of the raw material for the performance you would create, it was really important to honor that and to respect that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as a composer and a musician and somebody who, who creates instru instruments, I'm thinking for myself, how can I use this web and play this web in a musical way to create a musical performance? Um, in the performance, Isabel and Evan, I'm sorry, Christine and Evan are improvising uh, on their instruments and Isabel is guiding our journey through the spider web. And so as a musician, I'm wanting the spider web to listen, I'm listening to Evan and to Christine and looking at where we're going and I'm trying to shape the sound of the web to be an appropriate sort of musical uh, um, structure, musical composition in real time. So for me, the spider web actually ultimately was a complex data set. It was like raw material that I was sculpting to make the sound that you would actually hear in a performance itself. And one of the key elements, sort of the key structure of the spider web is this frequency, this sort of collection of frequencies, this dense web of frequencies which represent the structure of the sound. And the frequencies are, uh, as Isabel mentioned, directly related to the length of each individual spider web strand. Now the length of the spider web strands is in meters, so it's an absolute length of the strands, but we need to map those lengths to frequencies. And this is a typical process. Anytime you want to take a data set and translate it into sound, you have to think about, you know, what can we perceive as sound? And so the human range of perception from 20 hertz to 20,000 kilohertz, anything within that range, you know, especially maybe not all the way up at 20 kilohertz, but we'll be able to hear as sound. And so we took the 
physical lengths of the strings. And instead of using them as absolute measurements, we created a set of ratios where the length of the frequency of each string is uh, a ratio to the frequency of every other string based upon the ratio of their physical lengths. Um, Isabel created a bunch of functionality within her model to be able to do this and to be able to shape the way in which the lengths of the strings are mapped onto frequencies. In particular, you could define what the frequency range of the spider web is. Like what's the frequency of the longest strand versus what's the frequency of the shortest strand. The shortest strand is going to be the highest frequency, the longest strand is going to be the lowest frequency. And so by default, 20 to 20 kilohertz would be sort of like the standard range, but you could also constrain it by bringing the highest frequency down. Now, when you do this, you're actually changing the frequencies of the strand, right? You're changing the frequencies of all of the strands because all the strands are a ratio applied to this lowest to highest frequency range. So it's actually a very dramatic effect. And it's not a very natural thing. So the spider web is a physical phenomenon in the world. We want to honor this sort of like physical instantiation of the spider web and the vibrations of it. But if you go out in the world and you tap on a physical object and sort of excite it, you'll hear the frequencies of that object, but you won't be able to change the frequencies of the object without changing its size, something you can't do in the physical world. You're not often going to be changing the size of a piece of metal as you're playing it to change the frequency components within that piece of metal. Um, and the same is true for a spider web. So I was very careful not to change the frequencies of the spider web all of the time. It's a very dramatic musical effect too. It's very visible or an audi very audible and very sort of um, a little bit heavy handed to constantly be changing the frequency of the web. Um, but one thing that I would do is I would try to think about how um, how dense, first of all, the sound chain needs to be, and also what frequency range does the frequencies of the web want to be distributed across. If the frequencies of the web are distributed across the whole frequency spectrum, then it's too much information. Um, and there's not a lot of room in there for Evan and Christine to play. So if I can constrain that frequency range of the spider web to a smaller range, then that actually creates more space, and that can also create variations in the frequency range to sort of create variations in the musical performance. And I would do um, con control the frequencies of the web in a couple of ways. One is I wouldn't change the maximum frequency of the web, but I would change the minimum frequency of the web. So I would constrain the frequencies of the web between you know, an arbitrary minimum point and 10,000 Hertz was sort of my maximum that I always used. And what this does is it changes the frequencies of all of the strands. Um, in real time as I change that minimum frequency. Again, a very dramatic effect to do that, but it allows me to sort of uh, thin out the sounds as only higher frequencies and kind of creates more of a crystalline effect. Uh, and then occasionally bring the frequency all the way down so that the full frequency range of the web be audible. But then to remove some of the higher frequencies, I would use a standard electronic effect, which is a low pass filter. And a low pass filter will attenuate the frequencies of the higher, um, higher strands, the higher frequencies. It'll attenuate their amplitude so you won't hear them. And it'll only let the lower frequencies pass through the filter. And I can change the frequency of that low pass filter in real time too. And the nice thing about that, it's not changing the frequencies of the web anymore. It's just changing which ones you're listening to. It's changing the amplitudes. And so it's a more subtle effect and something that you can play with to create subtle variations without being so dramatic. Something else we thought a lot about is that in terms of music, um, in the physical world, if you go to go to a random object and strike it, it's going to have a lot of frequencies present, especially like a big sheet of metal, for example. You go hit a big piece of metal, you can hear a very dense, uh, uh, very dense sound with lots of frequency components. But when you think about music, we often think about pitched sounds. And pitched sounds uh, have frequency components that are organized a little bit more uh, rigidly. So a pitched sound generally will have frequency components that are integer multiples of what we call the fundamental, which is that lowest frequency component of, a, of an object. So when you play a piano string, there's a fundamental frequency, and then there's a lot of frequencies in addition to that lowest frequency, but they're all integer multiples of that fundamental. And so this idea of kind of quantizing frequencies to be all integer multiples of a lowest frequency was something that we found to be very useful and sort of a nice way to bring this sound from this kind of dense, very very um, clustery sort of sound uh, of the raw frequencies of the web, and then quantize them into more musical ratios and more musical um, more musical uh, uh, combinations. And so we would call this uh, making a just intonation, like setting a base uh, frequency, and then everything else is all the other frequencies are related to themselves by some ratio based on that lowest frequency. Um, or to think about like a, like a um, uh, imposing a harmonic structure on the web. So, um, so this is sort of one way, again, if I impose a harmonic structure on the web and I say this minimum frequency is 100 hertz, 
every frequency you listen to is going to be some multiple of 100, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. And by imposing that minimum frequency, I'm also reducing the complexity because you can't have uh, 100, you know, lots and lots of different frequencies. They're all only those integer multiples. And again, sort of like thinning out the texture of the web a little bit, making it a little bit um, less, uh, less dense and less um, kind of dissonant and bringing a sense of consonance to it. Now, if you just, if you use a very low frequency, like one or two hertz, you can simplify the, the frequency spectrum without losing that density. But as the lowest frequency sort of keeps ascending, you're gonna get fewer and fewer frequency components as they start to overlap. until so you get up to hundred hertz and that actually like limits the number of frequencies in the web quite a bit, it actually becomes quite, um, quite sparse. Um, so one of the, well, the consequences though of doing this, now we're using a digital system and a digital model. So it's very easy to quantize things precisely, but it turns out that actually in the acoustic world, precise integer ratios are not very common. Uh, in a guitar string, for example, when you pluck it, you're gonna get all of these harmonics that are integer multiples of the fundamental. But actually the material of the guitar string has imperfections in it. And the physical movement of the guitar string also has uh, an impact on the actual physical frequency content of that string. So you'll get small deviations in the frequency of the harmonics. And this is normal for us. This is part of the characteristic of physical sound that you're not gonna get perfectly in tune um, harmonics. Uh, but in a digital system, it's possible to get perfectly in tune harmonics. And so this is something else that I could play around with as a, as a performer. I could say, do I want a little bit of, of detuning? So a little bit of warmth, we often call it in electronic music, where we kind of warm things up by preventing things from being rigidly in tune and give them a small amount of a tuning variation around sort of those integer multiples of the fundamental. And that was a really important uh, component. And then one of the other things I would frequently do, again, for a musical effect, uh, more than just representing the, using the data as a raw, the spider's web as a raw data source, is to add what we call subharmonics. So as an electronic musician, uh, we have these powerful speaker systems with subwoofers that can generate these low frequencies, which are really fun and exciting to play with. And so I would add subharmonics. I would take a look at the, the frequencies that we're currently listening to from the web, and I would choose the lowest frequencies, and then I would create subharmonics, which are integer divisions of those frequencies. So if the lowest frequency is 100 Hertz, I might make a uh, subharmonic that's half of 100 or 50 or a third of 100 or 33 or a fourth of 100 or 25 Hertz. So adding those subharmonics is another fun way to sort of um, create a richer bass, low frequency bass for the sound. Um, but that's all sort of thinking about the spider web material as the frequency of the spider web as that original complex data source and just thinking about changing it and sort of manipulating it in different ways while trying to preserve the sonic structure of it. And one other element that I did think a lot about when I was designing the system is temporal element. So the spider web itself is, doesn't, isn't really temporal, it's a fixed form. And uh, we do move through the spider web and we're changing what we're looking at as we're moving through the spider web. But the idea is that as we're looking at it, the thing we're looking at itself is static, you know? So, um, so we're not moving through the web and sort of looking through the web as a performative element, we're sort of looking through exploring an environment. But as a performer, I wanted to add some temporal variations to sort of uh, uh, create uh, another level of interest, which is really not based on the spider web itself. It's really an imposition of me onto the spider web. And because I wanted to preserve the source and the quality of the spider web itself, I actually tried to have a very minimal amount of sort of temporal information superimposed on it. But I did do a lot of what we call amplitude modulation, which is varying the amplitude of the spider web, um, you know, either very slowly or sometimes really fast. Um, so you can kind of hear the amplitude of it changing. And then also adding um, a couple of other elements of uh, reverbs and delays. So here, just to quickly, this is a uh, 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 image which sort of just talks about how the frequencies that are created uh, by the spider web are processed to generate the final frequencies that you listen to. So we get the frequencies of the actual spider web itself and then we can round them, which is that process of quantization. And then we can add subharmonics to them and then send them out as an audio signal. And then uh, here I would take that audio signal and I would process it through sort of some very standard electronic processes to, um, to change the sound. We can filter out those higher frequencies. We can add reverb and delay, which are standard processes and then add some of that amplitude modulation and then spatialize the sound appropriately, like Isabel was saying, so you can hear the webs to the left on your left, the webs to the right on your right, and the ones in the middle in front of you. 
So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Christine to talk a little bit more about it. Hi there, I'm Christine Southworth. I am a composer and multimedia artist and joined this project after Isabel and Evan had been working on the model in Unity and the start of the sonification component. I'm not sure if I'm on the screen, but um, in any case, you can hear me, I think. Um, I play guitar in the performances and I design the set and videos for this project. Um, so the concept, as every spider web is unique, like no two snowflakes are exactly the same, each performance comes out of the exact same elements, but is completely unique. Uh, when we were designing Arachnid Drone Spider's Canvas, we began by thinking about the spider's web as her canvas. Uh, we were premiering the piece at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris, and the literal translation from Toile d'Araigne, French for spider's web, is the canvas of the spider. Our concept then evolved into thinking of her canvas becoming our canvas. Each, we'd be able to create our own music upon her canvas. Um, so we explore the web sonically from the point of view of the spider, and I wanted the performers and the audience to feel that experientially. This would involve creating a three-dimensional space on which we could project the model. The original design was a pyramid that I built in my living room using telescoping poles and shark tooth scrim. Um, I cut and sewed Velcro onto the scrim panels and mounted them on the poles. This concept then evolved into the cube that we use today, influenced by Tomas Saraceno and his spider webs, which are built in empty metal tubes. And here is a photo of one of them now. Um, in Saraceno's work, he places different species of spiders inside each cube sequentially to create multi-species webs. This is one of his webs that was on display in Paris. In our work, I chose to combine our virtual spider's web, modeled from a single tropical tent web spider, as Isabel described, with photographic images of local spider webs from both Massachusetts and Northern England. A combina combination of these elements is what is projected on our cube as we perform. And here are a few of those images now. So you can see these images if you watch the performance. Um, we'll have one tomorrow, but I do have a couple excerpts now. Um, this is one from one of our performances at MIT in February of 2019. Yeah, that's, um, that's one of the performances we had that a part of it that I, I really liked. So I just wanted to share that. Um, so as you can see, we're sitting inside of the projection cube and just as our spider sat inside of her cube. 
and were four performance performers. As part of the visual design for the piece, I wanted to present us as four parts of the same performer. Um, with our eight hands combined, the suggestion of us being a spider was very appealing. So we sit inside the cube facing outwards from the center, creating a single multi-organism performer, if you will. As Isabel drives through the web, we hear a part of the web that we're looking at, interpreted by Ian, and then Evan and I respond to that on our instruments, Iwi, uh, which is an electronic wind instrument, and my electric guitar with Ebo, which is a magnetic plectrum. Um, we layer on her web as Saraceno's spiders layered on other spiders' webs. Uh, here's one more excerpt from another MIT performance. Uh, you can see through the front of the cube, through the scrim actually, where Ian and it. Um, so I'm just seeing a um, question come in here um, about, is there anything rehearsed about the music or is it totally random? And are there rules guiding the interaction between the musicians? Um, and the thing is, so, okay, it is rehearsed. We do rehearse um, and we play it together. We've played um, a bunch of times and we had actually a, an interesting residency at MIT Nano, a new building that had just, um, had just gone up in the spring of, let's see, that would have been 2019. And what we are trying to do with this is to give ourselves a visual and um, musical sort of world that we can work inside of to create different music every time, but within the same confines. So we're using the elements, the same elements every time to start. Um, but where it goes is different every time. So it's a combination of improvised, but using um, the same elements. Basically we have our virtual and sonic representations of our spider web. Um, we have the photographs of the other spider webs and some videos from other spider webs, um, and then software and two musical instruments and each performance becomes unique from every other. Um, I hope that, um, that we can get back to that in a bit when we take questions. Um, and now back to Evan. I always find the spiders to be a hard act to follow. So uh, I, in the interest of, I have a few like lofty concluding words, but I think it would be really better to, um, to go to questions now. So maybe Lexi wants to guide us through that. Absolutely, let's uh, make a start. So perhaps we should start. So I'm going to try and take some of the questions in groups. Um, so there are a few questions here that relate to this question of whether there are scientific advantages. So we have from Rafi here, what are the advantages of displaying the data as sound inside the human range versus other sensors such as light? I'm going to add in some more here. One from uh, Pat Ridley, is Isabel able to give an example of how the sonification of the web helped in understanding its physical properties? Um, one from um, Akash, is sonifying spider webs aimed at answering a scientific question or is it just being done for fun? And there are a few more as well, both all sort of on the same theme of how the science interacts with the music. So maybe do you want to say something about that first Evan and then perhaps Isabel uh, could chip in too? Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, of course this piece, Arachnodrome, Spider's Canvas, is not itself science, it's, it's a work of art. Um, that's influenced by scientific research. And I, I do want to say, I mean, I think these are the questions that come up. And uh, 
you know, Isabel can address them more specifically, but she's also addressed them in the various research papers that she's co-authored based on her spider web research. But I think just to stick to the art part of it for a second before I let her answer those questions about the scientific value, I will say that m the musical value is not that it allows us to see what a spider sees or feel, or maybe in any specific way to understand what a, what the world of the spider is like, but it does make us make music in a different way. <laughs> and I have to tell you that that's a really astonishing thing for, for myself and I think for, uh, for Ian and Christine also, because I mean, I've been making music since before I could talk really. And this project really took me out of my comfort zone and made me think about what I was doing in a different way. And when I'm playing the piece, I feel like I'm experiencing things in a different way. And, and for an artist, that's hugely valuable. So um, with that, I'll, I'll let Isabel answer the actual uh, research scientific questions. So Isabel. Uh, yes. Uh, so the way the sonification model is set up is uh, if a fiber is very short, it will have a high pitch. And if the fiber is very long, it will have a low pitch, just like a harp. So um, using uh, the sonification model, you can uh, find the, here the different length of the fiber. So you, it, it describes the fiber length distribution. And you can also uh, find the fiber uh, quantity distribution. So if the sound is very dense, it will have a lot of fibers. And if uh, there's like very, like not many sounds, um, not many uh, simple timbre, it will have uh, fewer fibers. So it's a way to uh, find uh, fiber length distribution and fiber distribution as well. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, one of the ways that I imagine you would use this, Isabel, as a sonification tool would be imagining that you're controlling the viewpoint of the player. And so if you can control the viewpoint of the player, you have the agency to look around and experience the different qualities of the spider web, depending on where you are and where you're looking, right? And so that, as a, as a scientist, you know, you have access to that information and you have the agency. As a performance, the performer, the audience doesn't have that agency. Right. And uh, and even, you know, for myself, you know, I'm not controlling the movement through the spider web, so I don't have that agency either. So it's a very different kind of a thing. We're not necessarily expecting that people will walk away from the performance with an understanding of with the density of the spider web based on sonification. But as a, as a, as a tool for a scientist, I can see that could be very useful. Is that something that you you would do, Isabel? Would you sort of like wander through the web and sort of listen to it so to get an understanding of the structure? Yes. Uh, so you would wander the web and then find the location of higher uh, higher density, and then after that you can use your eyes to like look into it with more details. But just with sound, you can find the location uh, faster. I mean, for me, this is one of the most exciting kind of potentialities of a project like this, that interplay between being able to actually um, being made conscious of the things that perhaps are easy to interpret uh, through the sound that they make rather than through some kind of visual sifting process. It's actually not super obvious to me at least with what those things are, but it is clear that there will be certain elements uh, or certain aspects of physical systems. This is true for, and that's very interesting to explore. And um, so being able to, you know, through this artistic representation, actually um, find new ways to better analyze, better uh, explore these systems ourselves as, as scientists. So actually, in that vein, I'll, I'll pick up a, a couple of, uh, again, allied questions together. So Noah um, here is asking, the webs remind me of large scale maps of the universe showing galactic superclusters. Has this been sonified? We've also had another question. Um, so somebody is asking down here that we had a nice question about um, what is, uh, yeah, it's sort of from Philip Whitehead here. Um, what about other cross species music? Um, what about whales, ants, birds, etc. And there are some others as well. I think that, um, you know, I don't know if anyone wants to chip in with anything specific, but what I, uh, my understanding is that the headline here is that, yeah, absolutely, uh, you know, there are lots of opportunities here. I um, worked extensively with honeybees, um, actually, and uh, did a 25-minute string quartet with bee recordings. Um, so that 
they weren't playing with us, but um, as a beekeeper, and many of you might be beekeepers in the audience here, I'm not sure, um, bees, when they're happy, sing almost a perfect A. So if you put your head up to the hive and they're at a nice A hum, they're happy bees. And then if you hear the pitch rise, they're not happy bees and you probably wanna go away or um, get your smoker before you go into the hive. Um, but I recorded my own bees and used that in the piece. And then we, we also did some live performances with bees, um, which is not um, recommended, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but we ended up putting them outside and Skyping them in, which <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was about 20 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, it's very modern. Before Zoom, yeah, yeah, we could Skype bees in. We've also, I've worked with lemurs also. Um, they were, that was more, uh, they were more involved than the bees were. No, that's wonderful. So actually, I think that that indeed answers some of um, the, the Western, so somebody has asked, are there certain species known to respond to music? Do those species have similar um, brain structures? I guess, you know, um, the brain structures is, is quite a technical question, but essentially what you're saying here is that there are, there are some entry, interesting um, species specific uh, questions, issues here. Um, okay, so um, loads of interesting questions here. Um, so, okay, so somebody asked here, so Cliff Inman is asking, so music is the art of blending harmonically with others. These experiments to appear to generate random sounds. Okay, so essentially here asking the question, you know, is this music? I think this is a really interesting, a really interesting question. It's obviously sort of partly subjective. Do, does, does anyone, Evan, Christine, uh, Ian, Isabel, would, would someone like to chip in on that? Well, uh, we actually like the music. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, this has come up before actually when uh, you know we've done some performances where I thought well that really ended up being like quite beautiful and then uh, you know uh, somebody will comment on it and go like well you've really found you know some of the you know the hidden complexity or the hidden you know kind of uh, pathos of you know something very different than what what we thought we were doing so I, I think that uh, there's I noticed in the question that Christine answered that the question was posed and it was a, a, a very interesting question, but the way it was phrased was, is what you're doing rehearsed or is it random? And I think that for, for most musicians, there's a huge continuum between the rehearsed and the random <laughs> and depending on the idiom, right? I mean, even if you're playing completely notated music, you're interpreting it. But if you're playing jazz or if you're doing Indian raga or any number of improvisatory traditions, you're, you're setting up rules and you're improvising within that. So in this piece, we've set up a different type of set of rules where it's not always humans who are controlling. I mean, it's obviously Isabel or Ian, but Isabel is completely subject to the way the spider built her web. So the only instrument she can play is the instrument that the spider built. Now, granted, she tuned it, Ian uh, mixed it, but um, she's playing that instrument. And I guess the thing I wanna say about that is that, um, you know, this project has made me think about the nature of structure in a different way and the nature of exploring structure in a different way. Because one of the things about a lot of the other sonifications, including um, Professor Bueller's, which I quite like, is that it takes a material structure and it kind of projects it out onto the time domain as if the structure of, say, a virus, right, of the gene sequence of a virus or of the universe or whatever is somehow a hidden score, a hidden composition that's waiting to be played. Um, but there's another type of structure that's very important in music, and it's not, and that that is the structure of space as space, not astral space or molecular space, but um, the design of an instrument is structuring a space, is structuring materials in a certain way. A violin is taking certain materials that have certain properties, and you know encasing space in that in those violins and and a great concert hall or a gothic cathedral is also that and so a great violin or a great concert hall exists to reveal something hidden but it reveals something in two directions it reveals the artistry of the performer but the performer also reveals something about the space the sound of the violin the sound of the hall so um 
I don't think of that as random. I do think of it as sometimes uh, uncertain. And sometimes you find out things you're not quite sure what they are and you have to figure out how you're going to respond to them. But um, to me, that's, that's what makes it an interesting adventure. Uh, hopefully it sounds appealing or interesting to people that listen to it. Um, but, uh, but that's the way I see it. I, mean, I will say, you know, for me as an electronic musician, uh, I look back on my experience as an acoustic musician, working with sound, the, the physical world is so complex. And working with an acoustic instrument is a very complex system. And you're exploring that system constantly. And a good musician has a very nuanced understanding of the properties of that system. But when we translate this into something like the spider web, the spider web is a very complex system that I don't really, is more complex maybe than I can conceptually understand. And that's part of the joy of it right, is exploring it and, and, and listening to what arises out of it, but then also reacting to it, you know, on a moment by moment basis, kind of listening very carefully and being, you know, it, like uh, not uh, harmonically in tune, but sort of spiritually in tune or sort of, you know, cognitively in tune with sort of what it's generating versus, you know, what, where sort of our collective musical improvisation is taking us and constantly sort of making adjustments and movements and thinking about, you know, how can we sort of nu nuance this or massage this to get where we want to go as a, as a performing ensemble. And this to me feels a very natural process, you know, and it feels very like playing with the web has a very strong presence, which inspires us to think about things differently, like Evan was saying, you know, and create a piece of music that is, is based on that. But we're, we're always interpreting it very heavily based on our experience and where we're, what we're trying to do musically. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just picking up on some of the, the points that uh, you've made there and they're linked to, to the questions that people are asking. It really feels to me as though, you know, one of the really exciting things here is the ability to uh, to actually go out in search of sort of beauty in that complexity. You know, very often, you know, as a physicist, we work with systems that are incredibly complex, just like the web. We know if we zoom in on certain structures, we can really appreciate them for what they are. You know, these incredibly intricate, often beautifully symmetric, interesting structures. But when they're crammed together in something much bigger, it's very often hard to, uh, you know, to kind of pinpoint those or make sense of the whole. And this navigation through the web, through this sort of complex structure really resonates with that kind of, uh, that kind of process. Great, so um, one for Isabel here, a little bit more specific. Uh, so Kate here is curious about whether the species of the spider changes the web and therefore the sound that's made. And is this dis difference easily noticed or quite vague? So are we dealing with big differences in the natural world here or, or subtle ones? Oh yeah, different uh, species would build different type of spider web. So the one we use uh, is a search of a citricola, so they do a tent. But there's a different, many other fiber, uh, spiders that do like orb webs and um, cobwebs. So it would depend on the species. Yeah. Um, and there was another question. Um, yes. So, so um, also relating to the spiders here. Let's just um, take a look here. Um, Okay, yeah, so another, um, so somebody has commented that the spider web, so spider silk, is becoming um, increasingly attractive in structural design. You know, do, you, do you think there's a future to this? So presumably your work is, is quite closely related to this kind of idea, is that right? Uh, yeah, so silk is very strong and it's extensible. That's why it has been like, uh, it has inspired many applications in like biomedicine and uh, uh, structural design. Uh, so yes, so silk is very attractive, but then what is also attractive is the larger scale of silk, which is the large spider webs, because uh, spiders have been able to optimize those structures for millions of years, and they're doing something right. So that's, that's why we want to study them. Okay, great. And then a couple of questions sort of taking us back to that interface. Um, so a couple of people, Richard Thompson here and Martha have asked, you know, what, what about doing this in reverse? So is there something interesting about uh, taking music and turning it into spider webs? Um, is there something maybe that we can, so I'm now adding this glass myself, you know, is there something that we can learn from the creative process that you've been through uh, that, uh, that might make it interesting to, to invert this whole process? Well, I love that. Uh, that sounds, um, sorry. Okay. Uh, you want to uh, take this me? or? Okay, or? okay. Uh, I'll take it first then. 
Uh, that's something we've been very interested about. So you can uh, take any type of music and transform it into a side web. That would really depend on the sonification rules you decide on. So for our case, the rules we set up do not do reverse, but if you change the rules so that you can do reverse sonification, yeah, you, you can probably do a spider web. And I, I will say also, uh, Isabel is being a little bit modest, but in her lab, or the, or the lab she just completed her research in, uh, they have been doing reverse sonifications actually with proteins. So they would they would sonify protein. They, I don't know that they were doing it with webs, but with, with other uh, materials, uh, they would sonify proteins and then they tweak the, the music and then send it out and have the proteins made. So um, I'd love to do it with spider webs or with snowflakes. No, that's I great. know there have been some people who've been uh, who've been just taking music and using 3D printers to generate physical representations of a performance or of a piece. Um, so I don't think there was a band that was doing that for a while. They were on tour and every tour would end up with a 3D model of the performance um, arranged as, you know, probably over time in some kind of cube format. And then you, in the audience, you would get one at the end of the night to take home with you. Oh, that's great. <laughs> No, so um, as somebody has commented, you know, it, uh, so Pat Ridley here says it'd be really wonderful if the sonification of a crystal structure were able to help identify its symmetry group. So just to say this is exactly, you know, this is one of the things um, that has, uh, was right at the genesis of the, uh, of the project that we are starting. Um, personally, I'm very interested in this question of whether, um, you know, it's possible to hear the difference between a cubic structure hexagonal structure, etc. Um, and then building on that, you know, what sort of subtleties uh, we can, uh, we're, we're able to, what sort of physical subtleties we're able to, uh, to pull out from listening to the noises that these structures make, but also by doing creative things, uh, creative things with them. Um, so I'm slightly conscious of the time. Um, panelists, are there any other points that you would like to pick up on? I'm, I'm, uh, sorry that we've got an awful lot of questions here. I've tried to sort of consolidate them into themes, um, but does anyone, uh, is there anything that anyone would like to add um, before we wrap things up? So you're watching all the panelists now stare at the, uh, the screen here. <laughs> well, there's the Jackson Pollock question. Um, which that could be interesting. Yeah, okay, so uh, yeah, yeah. And if he was asking, could, could you set a Jackson Pollock painting to music in a similar way? So I'll explain uh, for those who might not be familiar. Uh, so a Jackson Pollock painting is a sort of, these were made big canvases uh, or pieces of uh, sort of wood uh, onto which uh, paint from paint brushes was drizzled in uh, repeatedly many, many layers. So these are uh, two dimensional artworks that kind of have a spider web like quality, I guess. Um. Um, the interesting, I mean, the spider web was an, a, a very appealing thing to, to use as, uh, because it's, it's strings and they have lengths. And there, I saw another question somewhere in here about, um, how, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what it was asking, but so, so if you, because the strings all do have different lengths, we did map those. So the sounds that you're hearing are like actually a, a mapping from the actual lengths of the strings. I'm not sure if that was, if any of us made that clear. Um, but so the pitches are directly related to the lengths of each piece of silk. Um, and then there was something else about um, us, could we use a different, so we're only using this single web in this particular project, that performance, of which we've performed several times. Well, we're, we're actually yeah. using a small fraction of that web, quite right. honestly. Um, right. And I st still don't know that we've explored all of it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, it was just that the entire web is way too much data to work with. Right. And so we had to sort of constrict ourselves. I mean, just to, no, the, the Jackson Pollock question. Oh, sorry. No, you I was going to say the Jackson Pollock question kind of raises this question around natural systems and sonification, and 
you know, this idea that the spider web is a one beautiful artifact of the natural world, but we are encountered with, you know, systems like this where there's repeating patterns that are constantly changing and have so much complexity and, uh, and they're just beautiful to, to, to visually see. And so this idea of really exploring these things in the sonified way is just another way of experiencing that same kind of wonder at the, stru at the inherent structure and also the inherent uh, randomness and the inherent sort of complexity of things that arrive uh, organically. Um, so I think that that, you know, the natural world has so many interesting, um, it's such a fertile ground for this. A Jackson Pollock painting is another thing because he's organized it somewhat aesthetically on his own structure. So we're getting a different kind of aesthetics from a Jackson Pollock painting than we will from a field of wildflowers or a spider web or any, or the, the structure of the universe, for example. Can I uh, pick up on that a little bit just for a minute? Um, so I also, some one of the prior questions was asking if people have, have sonified maps of the universe. Uh, and I, I guess the answer without knowing specifically who is yes, <laughs> because people are sonifying everything. But one thing I wanna say about sonification, whether it's of the natural world or of a Jackson Pollock is that you cannot leave out the amount of human choice that goes into sonifying. And this is something I mentioned in talking about um, earlier sonifications. Uh, and I, I was thinking about it in particular because another colleague of, of Ian's and mine, uh, Jesse Taylor, who's in uh, physics actually sent me recently a sonification of the, I will mispronounce this and I have no idea what it is, the dimuon invariant spectrum. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, was really excited and sent me all the vibrations of, uh, of uh, you know, eta and omega and phi and upsilon 1s and upsilon 2s, et cetera, and, uh, and various diagrams and, and then various sonifications, all of which sounded very different because as soon as you sonify all these frequencies, you just go, wait, what, now what do I do with this? And I think w the, the way that one has to look at this is that in the same way that if anybody has tried to make a chart or a diagram or a data visualization, you know that even if you know very well what it is that you're trying to visualize, you have to really put the psychology of yourself and your audience into your mind if you're gonna make an effective visualization. And the same is true with sonification. It's really just not a, it's not a matter of just going, let's sonify it. Okay, there it is, it's sonified. Now we know what Jackson Pollock sounds like, or now we know what the coronavirus sounds like, or now we know what a spider web sounds like. What you have gotten is the same way that if you just like hit, you know, uh, the graphic button on an Excel spreadsheet, you get something and you go like, well, wait, I can't use that. That doesn't show what I find interesting about this, or it doesn't, it doesn't make evident anything that I'm trying to learn from this. And you have to, it's not that you are going to change the data, but you have to change the way that you present the data. So in this case, what we really were thinking about was how to just create a, a way, I guess, you know, um, it all goes back to this movie, Fantastic Voyage that I saw when I was eight years old, where people shrunk down to the size of blood, of blood uh, corpuscles and were put into a little spaceship that went into the body and zoomed around. And I thought, well, that would be, you know, if, if you really want to think like a spider, you got to think about how a spider sees the world. And we can't do that. A spider has eight eyes. They have no ears. So even there is no hearing of the spider web because we can hear the way a microphone would hear it, which is what Tomas did. We can hear the way a human ear might hear it if you put it into human range. But there's a subjectivity involved in any sensory apparatus and in any interpretation of sensory apparatus. And so inevitably that component comes into play. That's fascinating. I think that's quite a nice note to, uh, to end on, unless anybody has anything um, specific to add. Okay, so um, I will thank everybody once again, Val Crowder, uh, uh, event uh, impresario here is a huge amount of support uh, behind the scenes um, and also to Roger Michael um, uh, and our other collaborators uh, who have done an, uh, done an awful lot of work over the last few months to uh, to put all this together um, and start this adventure thank you so much and good evening <laughs>